What's up everyone, Kevin Carrillo here and welcome to another episode of the Cananaboid Connect Podcast. My guest today is John Kearns, co-founder and CEO of New Bloom Labs. John Kearns, how are you doing, man? I'm well, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've enjoyed your show so far listening, and I'm, I'm pleased to be a guest. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're, we're trying, man. We're on episode, you're going to be episode 33. So uh, we've got some good traction going, and, and we're trying to keep the, the high caliber guests uh, apparent. So happy to have you on today uh, from the, the testing perspective. It's yeah, well, I'll see what I can do. We'll see if we can keep that caliber up. But <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, before we start, I want to give a shout out to your brother, Jesse Kearns, for hooking me up with this amazing New Blooms hat. Um, I, yeah, it's really cool, and I wanted to sport it today on the, on the episode. So, hey, You're wearing what we call our harvester hat. That's the 2020 uh, edition. Uh, we started those last year, and we bring them out about midsummer, and really just sort of give them out when we meet with growers and processors alike. And really when we're traveling around, which is a big part of what we do, you know, Jesse's been down there in Texas for four months now, basically just burning up the roads as much as he can, you know, in the COVID-19 era. But um, yeah, so you're one of the first uh, folks that have got the 2020 edition of the Harvester hat. So congratulations. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, I didn't realize y'all have a, a, a line that you're, that you're rolling out <laughs> for different seasons. So uh, I'm happy to be part of that group sporting this, this hat. So, um, so, hey, John, before we dive into New Bloom and, and you know, what all y'all are doing, not only in Ch- Chattanooga, Tennessee, but also expanding here into Texas, uh, let's first talk about your background and, and how you got started in the industry. Well, uh, I've come from a purely op- entrepreneurial background. Uh, for the last about 11 years, uh, I have been in the home health business. Uh, I started that back in early 2009 and uh, really grew uh, preferred care at home of Chattanooga to a market leader for you know, the past several years. And um, that gave me the opportunity over the years to look around at, at other opportunities, uh, consider other projects. You know, I dabbled around in, in some political campaigns here and there, and I've really gotten involved in, in Chattanooga's civic life and some nonprofit work. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of folks' hemp story starts with uh, December 2018, con- Congress passes the hemp bill. And like everyone else, I noticed the same thing. And it, it did seem like, you know, the, the state lines had, had dissolved, the market was going to open up. And so I did what a lot of folks did. I did some investigating. So, yeah. so at, you just had your entrepreneur hat on uh, and you saw this, this industry at the forefront and you were just interested and you thought, hmm, let me learn more about what's going on here. Yes, but it was more than that. Um, I, I'm a believer in the plant and in the product. Um, I, I believe that cannabis' pr- uh, promise in our country, and in fact, the world, is enormous. Uh, I, I'm a believer in its wellness and therapeutic benefits. Um, I'm a believer in its medicinal benefits. And so the idea that, that this market would come to the southeast, where at, heretofore it largely has not existed, and it's coming to us in the form of hemp, um, which to me was a really exciting opportunity to be a part of what is going to be, you know, a really large nationwide and, and worldwide movement as hemp prohibition continues to dissolve around the world. Mm-hmm. And, and when you mentioned your, your advocacy for the plant and, and understanding the benefits, you know, on a human level, you know, uh, what, what was your experience with the plant prior to, to hemp? I mean, were, uh, you know, were you a user? Were you, were you just an advocate that understood the benefits and kind of was a proponent for it? Or what was your position? I had been a, I had been a CBD. I had tried CBD in months and years past in places where you could get it. Uh, I had uh, sampled cannabis in places where it was legal. Uh, but uh, I, my experience was, was fairly limited. However, uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a reader and I'm a researcher, and I was well aware of, of the promise of cannabis larger, lar- in the larger sense. 
And uh, it's something that's very exciting to me. I believe that states that ended prohibition early, like the Colorados and Washingtons and Nevada and California and Michigan, you know, those states were, were real leaders in a really larger movement. Um, I was proud to see what their, what their, the wisdom that their legislatures exhibited in dissolving that prohibition and creating a, a legal platform for the the trade and consumption of cannabis and so when and in its own way it arrived in the southeast in particular where i live in tennessee in the form of hemp it's something that i wanted to be a part of and it just so happened that my way of being a part of it was to found new bloom labs right and so let's talk specifically about that so new bloom labs obviously in the lab testing space um, making sure that, you know, your crop doesn't go hot in terms of its potency levels, its THC levels. Um, so, so why that part of the industry, you know, what, what drove you or, or gra you gravitated you toward that, that piece of the business? You know, I first looked at establishing a small growing operation. Uh, I have some, some property about 40 minutes from where I live and I considered it, but while I was doing that research, um, a couple of things were apparent to me. Uh, it is a, is a plant that takes a lot of care and just given my schedule and sort of the way my life was and where I had access to land, I wasn't going to be able to give it that kind of care. I wasn't going to be able to, you know, haul off and commute all the way out to the farm every day and really tend to this plant and do it the way and, and care for it the way it deserves to be cared for. Um, the other thing that became very apparent to me is that there was a big bottleneck for quality laboratory testing, uh, particularly in our part of the world in the Southeastern United States at the time. So uh, I just kept hearing this over and over, uh, growing processors and, and growers and cultivators, they would all say, well, I would love to move this batch of my product. I would love to move this lot. Problem is I'm waiting on my lab results. I sent them to Massachusetts four weeks ago. I sent them to Colorado two weeks ago. I still don't have my results. And so, um, after hearing that dozens and dozens of times, it became clear to me that the Southeast needed a testing resource if hemp and cannabis was going to thrive here. And so we found a new Bloom Labs, my brother and I did. And, and at that time, was, was there only like a few players in the game when it came to testing? And, and, and if so, were there like just certain states that made that available? Or, you know, what, what, was, it, what was it looking like, the landscape for testing labs? Regionally, there were not a lot of labs, and that is a function of the fact that this plant had been completely prohibited for the last several generations. Uh, Florida has probably a glut of laboratories because of the medical program down there, uh, but in the, the, the Mid-South and the Southeast, there, was, there were essentially no laboratories. I believe maybe there was one in South Carolina, uh, but right about the time we got started, which was second quarter of 2019, some labs started to emerge along with ours in the Southeast. We were a part of that group. Got you. Okay. Well, and at this time, I mean, why don't you just go ahead and explain to the audience what, what new labs or excuse me, new bloom labs is and, and what uh, services y'all provide to farmers. We provide the chemical analysis of hemp and hemp derived products. Um, so that means that every, any, anywhere from, your seed propagators, your genetics propagator, your genetics providers, all the way through growers, uh, processors, products manufacturers, and retailers. All of these entities along that supply chain rely on quality chemical analysis to make sure that what they are producing is uh, what they intend it to be. In other words, it has the right potency. Uh, it, uh, they're, they're crafting the sort of products that they, that they, that they intend to develop. Uh, also, the biggest factor is to make sure that they're consumer safe. Are these products and this, this plant material, is it free from pesticides, mycotoxins, uh, harmful uh, mold and microbials, heavy metals? So you have to do those screenings to make sure that as you move through the supply chain, you're moving, th you're moving product through safely. And then of course, eventually it ends, uh, it ends up on a retail shelf. And because there's been such a rush to get in this industry, retailers are wise to have a robust testing program themselves uh, because there are a lot of new companies. Um, some of those companies and some of those entities may not be as diligent as they should be. And so 
Retailers are wise to have their own testing program to make sure that what they're putting on their shelves and what they are selling to consumers um, is as advertised or at least is as labeled. So when you talk about from the retail perspective, it's almost like like double checking to make sure that the potency levels are okay, right? Because you can have the grower get get it, the crop tested, but once they sell it to a retail store or a, or a CBD shop, you're suggesting that they should have protocols in place to make sure that, again, everything is, is copacetic. Absolutely, but it's not just potency. Potency is where you begin your testing program. Uh, I, I am probably more concerned about the consumer safety screenings, heavy metals, pesticides, mycotoxins, and the like. Um, the FDA recently issued a press release saying that when they would go and they would do random testing of cannabis products throughout the country, uh, a high percentage of those products would have those, those harmful toxins. And so, and, and, and really that's a function of a couple of things. One, it, it's a relatively new industry. And so best practices are still being established. The research and development of these manufacturing processes is, is, is ongoing and, and still very much in its infancy. And then the other thing is as this industry evolves, um, the, the importance of testing is still becoming apparent. Mm -hmm. and so not every operator, not every manufacturer or grower relies on cannabis testing the way that they should. And again, that's not necessarily, you know, it, it may be because someone's not doing their job and not being as diligent as they should, but really it, it more to me, it seems to be a function of the newness of the industry itself. Would you also say, in addition to the newness and the fact that the industry is evolving and new regulations are being put in place, um, would you say in addition to that, that the plant itself, um, like we're kind of trying to re-engineer how the plant's grown in terms of, you know, staying within those boundaries of regulation. So for instance, you know, you plant a hemp seed and naturally the the plant attracts those metals and and different things because it's it's kind of clearing and cleaning the soil right so a lot of these regulations that are in place it's it's somewhat counterintuitive just because the nature of the plant itself and how it's grown yeah yeah perhaps i mean again these best practices are still being established from from uh you know genetics development to to cultivation practices extraction uh, isolation, products manufacturing. So throughout the supply chain, again, we're just, the end, all of us in this industry are relative neophytes. Now, now to be clear, there are experienced uh, cannabis producers out there, though the folks have been doing it for decades. But as far as producing cannabis products on the scale that we are now producing it nationwide and, and that we will be producing it in the years and decades to come, we're still learning how to do that. Sure. And I think really kind of what's what's happening um, from a, a mislabeling perspective and from a consumer safety perspective all these best practices are still getting established and let me add that it doesn't help that every state has its own program there are states that have very robust regulations there are states that have very laissez-faire regulations and so that's also difficult for the industry to navigate mm -hmm. and and at the at the federal level i mean where is the fda at in terms of um, you know, putting those guidelines in place for consumer safety and whatnot. I mean, are we, are we there yet? Is there still work to be done or are we still learning? As you say, million dollar question, I think right now, I think that there are some, and it seems that there are indications out of the administration as of now being mid August, 2020, that there is some FDA, there are some FDA rules afoot that we should be seeing something soon. No one knows what soon means. <laughs> right. That's the million dollar questions, right? <laughs> We're all in pins and needles waiting for that. Um, so let's talk about testing best practices, you know, from the perspective of the grower versus the processors versus the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's start with growers, uh, you know, just to put it into a, a, a brief statement, you know, the best practice is once flowering begins in the field or in the greenhouse or in your indoor grow, um, you would want to test every week for potency until you feel like your potency is starting to peak and getting, getting up to that 0.3% legal threshold. And that way you can effectively plan harvest because 
as you know, once we cross 0.3%, you no longer have a viable crop. You no longer have a viable product in the marketplace, and that's, that's disastrous. So a testing program that includes regular potency testing, uh, particularly under new USDA guidelines, which solidify the 0.3% total THC standard nationwide. Uh, Tennessee, uh, up until October 31st of this year, has been and will be a Delta 9 state is what they called it. So basically, we only measure Delta 9 to establish legality. That's going away for everyone. And for most of the country, it's been total THC for a while anyway. But point is, you want to make sure that you're effectively planning your harvest. So when you start seeing that, that potency creep up near 0.3%, that's when you want to make sure that if you're in a state that requires an official test, you're ordering that official test and you're planning the date of harvest because you, again, you don't want plants, you don't want an entire crop to go hot as we call it. And then, you know, you're essentially out of your investment in an industry where crops can't yet be insured. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's dive into that a bit deeper when it comes to total THC, Delta nine, Delta eight. I mean, a lot of those terms get thrown out there, but, um, Explain to us in, in, in more detail just the differences between those, those levels and well, the definitions. Essentially what we're talking about are the, these are molecules, right? So I think most folks know Delta 9 THC is the molecule that is, that is um, responsible for providing that very acute psychoactive effect. It's the one that gets you high. Um, so... Uh, but in order to measure total THC, you don't just look at Delta-9. You actually look at what's called the precursor to Delta-9, which is THCA. So basically, um, it means that when you heat up THCA, like if you were burning it in uh, roll paper, rolling paper, for instance, it would convert to Delta-9. Then that molecule you ingest, and that creates that high. So what the government has wanted to do is – is measure both of those molecules to make sure that the that what they're regulating is the effect on the body, not just a chemical reaction on a piece of paper, right? So, so what they're trying to do is is mimic the real world effect of the consumption of these products. So the way you do that is you take THCA, you take delta nine, you add them together, you multiply it by a factor, and then that's total THC. That is the new legal standard. Again, there are states in the past that have just measured Delta 9, and they got by just fine doing that for many years. However, the USDA came out on October 31st of last year and said, now we're all going to total THC. What's important, I think, for folks to understand the real-world effect of that is that it lowered the legal standard for potency by a lot, actually. Which which makes it difficult in a state like Texas, especially for growing outdoors, because the plant the the sun rays can ultimately make the THC potency levels increase, right? So you have to always be watching, monitoring your crop, and of course testing to make sure that you don't go above that 03 percent threshold. Yeah, um, you know the number one indicator of how potent a plant or crop is going to be is its genetics. But there are certainly growing conditions uh, that can contribute to that. Um, so, you know, particularly hot places, you will find cultivators that, that, that struggle with maintaining legal, legal potency. That's, that's, that's true. What do you see in Texas in terms of like percentage wise? I mean, uh, from my understanding, speaking to the Texas Department of Agriculture, there's about 850 licenses that have been issued to farmers. Of those 850, what percentage would you say is growing outdoor compared to indoor? We don't have that data yet. Uh, again, it's the inaugural year for hemp in Texas, and we are really just now into the flowering season for these outdoor grows. We just don't have that data yet. So, but I mean, if you had to say of who you're working with now, are they more outdoor or more indoor of what you're seeing from your customers? Probably more outdoor, but again, you know, that will, in, in the next, ask me in 30 to 45 days, and we may have a better idea. But yeah, there's probably a preponderance of outdoor grows at the moment. Um, I, t I can tell you what we've seen in the Southeast is, you know, we saw a huge percentage of our growers, particularly new growers, were growing outside. Um, we saw the, the growing, the grower market retract by about 50% this year. 
Um, and a lot of those growers that stuck with it moved to an indoor greenhouse grow. Um, so that may be a trend that we see in Texas just a year later. Yeah, that's what other guests on the podcast have echoed in terms of, um, you know, like you said, this is the first year. It's, it's a learning year for most growers. And, and I, we think the trend is going to be that anything that's grown for consumption um, or you know, extraction of cannabinoids will be indoor. And then everything that would be grown for processing for hemp or herd would be outdoor. Um, it, it does seem like the industry is starting to learn that, that that's the best technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we talked about testing best practices from the grower side. Let's talk about it from the processor's perspective. Yeah. So with, with processing, it's all, it's, it's not only about uh, checking your, um, your formulas and making sure that you're crafting products that are the correct potency for what you're trying to achieve. But again, it really gets back to um, consumer safety. So uh, you want to make sure that any biomass that you're buying, any flour, any plant material that you're buying, period, you want to make sure that you are conducting a full panel test. Now, um, I want to pause here and really stress something. If you're a processor, chances are your grower is going to bring a full panel certificate of analysis to that transaction. And that's great. They should be bringing us full panel certificate of analysis. What we urge everyone to do is that on both sides of the transaction, both parties get a COA of the same product just to verify. Um, we, I cannot tell you how many times, I cannot tell you how many times we get calls in here saying, hey, can you test this real quick? I think something might have gone wrong. Well, why went wrong? Well, I bought this, uh, this weight of hemp. Um, I was told it had a, a clean COA, but uh, I suspect something may be amiss. Lo and behold, we run the test for them. It had heavy metals in it. Or lo and behold, the potency was much lower than advertised on that certificate of analysis. So as a matter of diligence, as a matter of making sure that you don't get burned at one point or another in the marketplace, anytime you are buying hemp or a hemp product or anytime you are selling hemp or a hemp product, bring to that transaction a full panel certificate of analysis from your trusted laboratory. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just do your due diligence, basically, you know, and just trust but verify is what it sounds like. I understand, you know, producers probably find that expense line on their P&L for testing the most annoying one, and I get it, but it's insurance. It's an insurance policy in an industry where we can't, for the most part, can't buy insurance yet. Let your lab be your insurance provider. Yeah, I mean, per test, I think it's what, like six, it could range from like 60 to $70 or something like that. So definitely worth, um, you know, doing it and doing your due diligence and it, instead of waiting and finding out that your crop is not, you know, within regulation and you lose out. So, John, let's talk about from the manufacturer's position then, uh, testing best practices. Yeah, so... Um Again, anytime you're receiving some, some intermediate product, a distillate or, or an isolate that you are going to take to develop a product, of course, you want to verify with your own full panel COA. We'll start there. Um, you can do some really interesting things at the product manufacturing level. Uh, of course, you want to check and make sure that the potencies that you're developing for these products are right. So, you know, regularly sending off batches of product for potency testing to make sure that you're your manufacturing processes are true is, is critically important. But also, you know, one of the tests that, that uh, I find the most fascinating is terpene profiling. And that's getting a good sense of what terpenes uh, that plant produced that made it through to the product. Um, there are now uh, isolated terpene providers out there and you can spike products with, with specific terpenes to create a certain therapeutic effect or a user experience. I think that science is perhaps the most fascinating science in all of cannabis. Um, terpenes dictate whether a, a product gives you energy or makes you sleepy or relaxes you. Um, it determines the, the flavor of the product. You know, some people will say cannabis tastes skunky. Some people will say cannabis tastes like diesel. Well, the truth is cannabis tastes like all those things depending on how strong those various terpenes are. It's a really fascinating part 
of, of cannabis science and product manufacturers, really astute product manufacturers will take the time to really dial in a terpene profile for their products. And so I encourage anyone who's considering um, creating a product line uh, in cannabis or in hemp to really take a look at those terpenes and, and develop something innovative at the terpene level. It's really fascinating stuff. Well, and even it seems like because the terpenes are so complex and so fascinating that the testing specifically for terpenes, I mean, you could, you could probably learn a lot about all the various terpenes that are out there, right? And their, their profile, their, their aroma profiles and their, like you said, their, their user experience and what exactly they'll do to you in terms of how it'll make you feel. Um, is there a specific testing for that, like solely, or is it part of the full panel? Yeah, so there's a standalone a la carte test called a terpene profile. Uh, so right now, New Bloom Labs offers a, a terpene profile with, I believe, uh, I've, I, you've caught me, I think 18 or 20 terpenes. We are actually expanding that profile. Um, that'll expand exponentially. So pretty soon, we're going to be able to offer a terpene profile with every known terpene that we can buy a, a, a control standard for. Got you. Well, that's exciting stuff. Um, I want to go back to the point that you were talking about earlier when, so testing best practices, the grower perspective, you, you help define total THC um, and how that's the trend nationwide now. Um, that's where, where every state's going to go to. But I want to talk specifically about Delta-8 THC. Uh, yeah. This topic has come up a number of times on, on the, the podcast and from my perspective, it seems like a bit of a loophole right now within the, the hemp industry or the, can, the, the cannabinoid industry. Yeah, I think, yes, it is a loophole. Um, and we'll see if that loophole gets closed legally. I don't know if it will or not. There's some speculation out there that it will get closed because surely it must get closed. Because basically, Delta-8 is very similar to Delta-9, has a very similar structure um, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a sister molecule. Um, and it produces a similar effect to Delta 9 THC, although it seems to not be quite as acute. So, um, there is this rush in hemp states to offer specifically Delta 8 products because Delta 8 isn't defined and prohibited in law anywhere. So that's the loophole, but the, the Delta, so whether that gets closed or not, I think Delta-8 produces at the moment another challenge, another problem to this industry. And that is that the rush to offer this, these products um, has been so severe that from what we are seeing, most of the clean, quote unquote, clean Delta-8 products out there are in fact not clean Delta-8 products. They contain in many cases, a great deal of Delta-9 remaining. In many cases, a great deal of Delta-10 and two isomers of Delta-10, which um, again is a, another lesser understood tetracannabinoid. But uh, the point is, if you go on to Facebook and you look to, to people that are trying to sell you a Delta-8 product, nine times out of 10, they're gonna show you a certificate of analysis from a lab that says this is pure Delta-8. Um, very often when we test those products, we find out that they are not pure Delta-8, that there's a lot of Delta-9 in there, which creates a legal problem for whoever is possessing it. So we are not saying that there is no such thing as pure Delta-8 out there. There are good, clean Delta-8 products in the marketplace. I do not believe that it's most of them at this point. Now, again, new industry, new techniques, maybe this will sort itself out in the months to come. I certainly hope so. Uh, but... At the moment, uh, what, what we are saying, what I am saying, what New Bloom Labs is saying is that with Delta-8, proceed cautiously and test. Please, please test a trusted lab that, um, you, know, we, uh, you know, our extraction processes are great. We are able to see these, these very similar cannabinoids and, and achieve beautiful separation in our chromatography so that we can tell without a doubt that yes, there's Delta eight here, but there's also Delta nine here. There's also two uh, isomers of Delta 10 here. So again, just, this is just a buyer beware, consumer beware, producer beware. Delta eight's out there. There is good Delta eight out there, but there's a lot of bad Delta eight out there. 
And how are they, I mean, obtaining those COAs? Are they just pulling some generic COA for Delta 8 off the website and saying, here you go, this is what, this is what we have for a certificate of analysis? Are they, are they making these themselves and, and you know, portraying fraud? Or, or what, what exactly, like, how are they, are, are, are they going with bad testing labs that just aren't fully capturing what's in there? Probably a combination of all of the above, but I don't know the, I really just don't know the precise answer to your question. I don't know why the analysis of these products seems to be so poor at the moment. Okay. And well, from your perspective, like is, is I, I would imagine that lab testing technology and equipment is very important, right? Um, the better technology, the better equipment you have, the more precise your testing will be. So is that a differentiator for New Bloom Labs? Oh, it is. So we built our lab entirely with new instrumentation from Agilent, which is the world leader in, in um, analytical uh, chemistry um, in, in these instruments, excuse me. But uh, so yes, there's, there's this rush to get into this industry. And so some folks, I always liken it to, I'm going to buy an instrument off of eBay, throw it on a card table and say I'm a lab. We've seen that out there, unfortunately. I'm not going to name names, but it's out there. So just choose carefully. Um, even certified refurb instrumentation, which is a perfectly valid way to build a, a lab, you know, it has its challenges. Those warranties are shorter. Those, those, um, um, the, the, the gaskets and whatnot in the instrumentation, they're older. So, you know, it, it does degrade quality over time. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with a certified refurbished instrument. It's fine. But, you know, we were careful at New Bloom Labs to make sure that we were establishing sound science from the outset. That's why we invested in brand new instrumentation. It's why we invested in the best science team that I could find in the country, led by Natalie Syracuse, who is our chief science officer and laboratory director. So at our company, what we decided to do was put science first and then follow it, follow it up with unmatched customer service. That's why when you call New Bloom Labs, someone's going to call you back. That's why when you need a certificate of analysis that's interpreted, you know, you're going to talk to a, a member of our science team that's going to help walk you through the results of your analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's been apparent. I mean, especially uh, being in the Dallas area, you know, it seems like New Bloom is the go-to lab for testing. I mean, there, I know that there's only a couple that are, that are licensed uh, testing labs at this point, but um, from the other competitors of New Bloom, it seems like y'all are the only ones that are hyper-focused on hemp. It's not just a, you know, an, a, an arm of your business. You know, it's, it's something that you focus specifically on, which is- Well, we buy a hemp testing lab because we operate in, um, in states where only hemp is legal so far. So, and, the, and those, are the, those are the states and that's the market that we, that we serve. I am absolutely certain that as time goes on, as the legal realities change, we will be testing medical grade cannabis, we will be testing adult use cannabis. But uh, all of the science as far as those different segments of the industry is all the same. Yes, we are hyper-focused on hemp because we believe in hemp, we believe in the plant, because we are, are a Tennessee company and we are a Texas company and soon we'll be expanding to other places. But yeah, we focused on hemp. I hope that we are the testing leader in Dallas. I hope that we're the testing leader for all of Texas. Um, there are labs emerging in Texas. Uh, I can't speak to uh, their approach to the work. All I can say is that for New Bloom Labs, we start with sound science and we follow it up with unmatched customer service. And so, I mean, we've talked and it's pretty obvious that we're at the forefront of this, industry, of this industry and every day new policies, regulations, legislations are being passed. Things are changing, right? So, so how, how do y'all, especially being in the testing lab space, how do y'all keep up with, with all these changes? I mean, is there direct communication with the government? Um, if not, like, are you just basically doing your due diligence every day to keep up with all this stuff or, you know, how do you, how do you go about that? Yeah, there's little to no direct interaction with governments. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's not on us though. That's on them. <laughs> um, I will say that from a, a local and state government pers perspective, we spend a lot of time reaching out to those various agencies, including de you know, departments of agriculture, law enforcement agencies, DEA, 
Um, number one, letting them know that we're here and what we're up to. Uh, number two, giving them feedback about what our experience is and, and what we believe would be in, important to our industry from a regulations perspective. We're very involved at the Tennessee Growers Coalition, excuse me, the Tennessee Growers Coalition. I'm on the board there. My brother is on the board of the Texas Hemp Coalition, which is just getting started this year and we will be going to Austin next year for session to, to advocate for, for the hemp industry. So we spend a lot. Go ahead. Shout out to Alyssa Nolan of the Texas Hemp Coalition. <laughs> She's been a real leader in really rallying the industry around the importance of, of good regulations because te Texas so far, I think I can be frank enough to say, you know, has established a mixed bag of regulations. Some of them are intelligent. They serve the industry. Some of them do not. And so, but every state is like that. No state gets it right out of the gate. And so it's critically important that we form these coalitions and go to our state capitals, go and talk to our legislatures and our commissioners and say, hey, this is what works and this is what doesn't. Because if we don't do that, I can promise governments will take it upon themselves to continue crafting poor regulations. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And that's got to be a challenge. I mean, I guess specifically talking about Texas, because from my understanding, um, the state government doesn't meet for a session. They meet on a, on a basis of every two years, right? So when you're actually meeting with those, those legislators and those policymakers, you better have everything ready to go and present and, and, and be prepared for some in-depth conversations, right? I mean... Regardless of where you are, state legislatures are, are typically, they're not full-time legislatures. It's not like the United States Congress that meets several times throughout the year. They have a session, they go home. And so, yeah, you've got to get your ducks in a row. Uh, you've got to, you've got to uh, plan really good you know, days at the Capitol where you're going to uh, bring the industry together, and you're going to walk the halls, and you're going to talk to your senators and your representatives, and you're going to go meet with your governor and say, this is what's important. Um, so be, getting organized during the off season is critical so that when the legislature meets, it goes back in session, you can be there, you know, uh, waving the flag for the industry and making sure that you get good rules, regulations and laws that will foster a profitable business for everyone in the industry. And have you been in Texas long enough to, to meet during those session, that session or, or uh, is that coming up for y'all? It's coming up for us. Uh, we've, we've done a couple of sessions in Tennessee so far, uh, but this coming session uh, in Austin will be our first Texas. And how do those conversations go in Tennessee? You know, it, Tennessee's interesting. Um, there is widespread support, it seems, from lawmakers for hemp. In fact, when Tennessee back in 14 ended hemp prohibition on a, with a limited, a very limited pilot program, it was one of the only bills in recent memory that passed uh, unanimously and went to the governor's desk for signature. Um, it's really one of the only major pieces of industry legislation uh, that, had, that had achieved that status. So Tennessee had a, a, brought a lot of support to hemp. Then we had this limited pilot program, learned a lot of things, tinkered with the rules a little bit and then 2018 happened and so federal you know federal prohibition ended and we could trade across state lines and so i can say that tennessee and kentucky were real leaders in the southeast about establishing good hemp programs um texas is just now getting started they'll get caught up texas is big and everything in texas is big so it's going to be a big industry but taking care as an industry to make sure that we're interfacing with our lawmakers, with the governor, with our commissioners, with our assistant commissioners and deputy commissioners, and make, giving them the feedback that they need to make sound decisions about hemp and cannabis policy moving forward is really everyone's job at this point. And what are some of those big ticket items for New Bloom Labs that you're going to present to these legislators come the next session? What, what are some of the, the major focus items that you're, that you're wanting to cover? I think it's a little premature on that. Uh, the Texas um, Hemp Coalition, its board is meeting for the first time later this week. And so it will get together and we'll create uh, a, a legislative agenda over the course of the next few months that I'm sure will get announced. And then there'll be events in Austin where we'll all get together and we'll go talk to those lawmakers. It's a little bit early for that. Right now, what we're doing is we're waiting and watching. We're seeing how this inaugural season, this inaugural hemp grow, how it works. 
We want to see who succeeds, how many people succeed, where the, where the pain points are. So that's what we're doing right now so that when we get together with the, the Texas Hemp Coalition, we can say, hey, here's what we've seen. This is what works. This is what doesn't work. And as far as what doesn't work, this is how we like to see it change. So right now, we're waiting and watching. We're gathering data. We'll come up with a legislative agenda in the months to come. That makes sense. Yeah, you want to kind of let things play out. It's so new here in Texas. Um, having said that, because Tennessee uh, got involved in 2014 for with those pilot programs that you mentioned, um, what learnings have you seen comparatively from Tennessee to Texas? Or is it still too soon also there? Yeah, I mean, again, comparing it to Texas, it, it is premature because the book isn't written on how well this year's gone yet. We've barely begun. Right. Texas, uh, excuse me, Tennessee learned some things, you know, it opened up um, the available uh, seed sourcing that was available to hemp producers, which was a huge deal. In the early years, you could only get your seed from, I don't know, four or five different sources. And even then the genetics that were available to you were very limited. Most of them came out of Oregon. Um, so now that world has opened up and you, and the result is beautiful, brilliant research and development. Uh, not only in the cultivation fields, but in product manufacturing and development. And so we just have so much more genetic material available to us in, in Tennessee because um, we changed the rules. We had a very restrictive genetics program, then we opened it up. And now, you know, there are a lot of hemp producers out there that are really flourishing because of that. Right, right. No, that makes sense. Um, so let's switch gears, John. I want to hear some of the the biggest horror stories when it comes to uh, lab testing in your experience, you know, whether it be in Tennessee or Texas, without naming any customers or clients, of course, not naming names, but what, what, what stories have you encountered or, or experiences where it's been like, this is the nightmare, something went wrong or, you know, someone didn't do due diligence. I'll give, a, I'll give a, just a couple of pretty classic examples that I've seen a few times at different scales. One is the fairly new grower, who didn't pay heed to the advice about the importance of potency testing. Um, he or she invested in a pretty large grow, um, several acres, maybe several different types of genetics, spent a lot of time, money, a lot of sweat and tears go into this grow. They don't bother with private testing. They get to, the, they get to when they think harvest is, they call the state and say, come out, I'm ready for my official test and then their crop is hot by a long shot. Mm. And it's gone, it's gone. There's no remedy. You can get a retest, the retest comes back hot as well. There's no remedy, that, that crop is gone. And again, this is, an, this is an agricultural industry that you know, really can't buy insurance yet. There's no crop insurance yet. So that's just a tough loss. And that, that is absolutely heartbreaking because when we learn of those folks it's when they've gotten that first hot test and they can't believe their eyes and ears and so they send it to us really quick to say hey is this right and we say yeah that's pretty much right your, your crop's hot you know we, you know sorry that that's it's awful um so that that's awful then the other one is um with the buying and selling of hemp and hemp products, you know, when you have um, someone buys a great deal of, of biomass or flour, trusting the, the certificate of analysis that the seller brought to them, trusting it's going to be 18% CBD or 20 plus percent CBD, um, and then they get it back and, you know, it tests as a, a relatively, you know, impotent product. Um, same thing can happen with a, with a crude or a distillate. Um, seller brings a COA to a transaction. It's got a certain potencies to it. It is free of pesticides, free of heavy metals and the like. Uh, producer spends tens of thousands of dollars on a, a large quantity of this product, get it tested themselves. They've already conducted the transaction. Turns out it was dirty or it wasn't as potent as it was supposed to be. That happens, and that's the reason I stressed it early on in the podcast about the idea of getting a, trans, a, a certificate of analysis on both sides of the, the transaction because I have seen these horror stories. I have seen friends in the industry lose tens of thousands of dollars in a transaction. Mm -hmm. It happens. Again, a lot of this, I think, is a function of the newness of the industry. I think new industries tend to 
to attract some maybe unsavory characters sometimes. Those folks are out there and they are looking to burn you. Let me promise you, they are there. They are looking for your Facebook profile. They are trying to sell you something and they're going to bring you a fake COA and they're going to be more than happy to take your money and disappear. So please don't let it happen. Again, let your lab be your insurance partner and it'll, it'll save you a lot of money and a lot of heartache. Well, speaking of that, say you're a grower outside of Texas, outside of Tennessee, there's not much infrastructure and specifically, you know, testing labs in place in your local area. So how would one ship hemp for testing? The United States Postal Service. That is the one answer to that question right now. Let me say, in fact, we learned a hard lesson about doing business with FedEx. Um, the same thing goes with UPS, though. Private freight carriers have policies that disallow the shipment of hemp and hemp products and, and in fact, cannabis and cannabis products. Those policies are there. They're internal policies because there are so many different various state guidelines and they can't promise that a truck going through Idaho wouldn't get stopped in a place where that product happened to be illegal. So they just, they say, we're not going to do this business. Now people ship hemp through FedEx and UPS all the time and it gets through but what happens is if UPS or FedEx gets wise to what sort of business you have, they look up your website, then they're going to start flagging those parcels and they're going to start pulling them out. They're going to start opening them. Or what's more common is the driver smells the package because it smells of cannabis and they know what that smells like. So, um, so they, they send it to security, they open it, they seize it. Sometimes they call you to tell you they got, your package sometimes they don't sometimes they call law enforcement sometimes they don't it just goes off into to the black ether of seized parcels for fedex and ups so thankfully the united states postal service last year came out and articulated a policy saying that we will ship it is legal for producers and consumers to ship hemp and hemp derived products through the united states postal service so I urge everyone, if you're going to send samples to a lab, if you're going to send products to a retail store, if you are going to send um, any hemp-derived product anywhere using a carrier, please use the United States Postal Service. Now, oddly, this week, the Postal Service is in the news, if you haven't noticed. So... <laughs> I was going to bring that up. I was wondering when you're, because <laughs> there's things have changed, right? In that, in that aspect. Yeah. So we are starting to see this ourselves here at New Bloom Labs. We're starting to see it out there in, in the industry. Hemp producers grousing about the fact that, hey, I sent this last Monday. It's still not at your lab or it's still not at the retail store. I think generally speaking, it's safe to say that the postal service is running a little slow at the moment. Right reason and I don't care what that reason it is it just seems to be running slow so here's our advice when you go to ship hemp to a lab or wherever you're shipping it use priority mail express for most plot places in the country no matter where you're sitting that's going to be a two to three day guaranteed transit very often it's a one day transit you do have to pay a little bit more for it um, but at this time when the postal service is slowed down it behooves you to go ahead and pay, pay a little bit more to get that expedited service. Again, it's Priority Mail Express. That's the one you want. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. And, you know, John, we've, we've touched on a lot of topics. You've been very knowledgeable when it comes to, you know, discussing all the innovative things that New Bloom Labs is doing, testing best practices as it relates to the grower, the processors, the manufacturers. Um, you even talked about best, best practices for shipping uh, hemp. Um, is there anything else that you want to cover uh, and, and discuss with our audience before we, before we end our, our episode? You know, I just want to say how optimistic I am about the hemp industry in Texas. Uh, I, it's really going to matter to Texas and Texas growers, Texas agriculture in the years to come. Um, for anyone that might be frustrated by the Texas heat right now, for anyone in Texas that might be frustrated by learning these new growing practices and this new, new plant that they're growing for the first time in their lives on their land, I want to caution you to, um, to persevere, to stick with it, 
you're going to learn more this year. You're going to learn even more next year, and you're going to learn even more in year three. Um, be careful you know, with the scale of your investments. But hemp and cannabis is here to stay. It is in Texas to stay. It's going to be a big deal. My favorite thing about hemp and cannabis is from the agriculture side. You know, I grew up in Upper East Tennessee in a place called Greenville, Tennessee, and that was the center of the universe for what's called burly tobacco. That's cigarette tobacco. When I was growing up, you would drive down the road, and on both sides of the road, as far as you could see, in August, there would be six-foot-tall tobacco plants. Now, in the 90s, the government went after the tobacco companies, and all of that went away. You go to Greenville right now, you could drive around for an hour before you would find a small tobacco patch. Tobacco was a big deal for our part of the world. It was a, um, it was a way to supplement income. You know, your history teacher, your insurance agent, you know, they might have a, a, a tobacco grow on their farm and it put their kids through school, put braces in their kids' mouths. And it was a big deal economically. There were a lot of full-time tobacco growers, but really it's the those part-time growers that used it to supplement their income. Um, that went away when the regulation of the tobacco uh, companies was escalated. Hemp and cannabis has the potential to replace that for family farms has the potential to replace that for part-time farmers, has the potential to replace that and supplement income again for, for farmers and growers that you know, have easy access to good quality cannabis genetics. And as the, as the industry evolves, we have access to good sound growing practices based on our growing zone and our climate zones. Um, so the business is going to be there. The, the, the opportunity is going to be there. What we have to make sure of as an industry is that we, we interact with our governments and make sure that we continue to further prohibition, uh, further, further legalization of cannabis at large across the country and across the world, because that is what will really open up this opportunity for these producers. Um, and making sure that, you know, that we are good at, at regulating ourselves as an industry and that uh, you know, we're using best testing practices. We're being diligent in making sure that we're, we, we aren't using um, illegal pesticides and harmful pesticides and making sure that, that those um, are remediated out of any product that makes it to the shelves. So establishing trust with consumers, establishing cr trust between the industry and our various government agencies and our various legislatures going to be important because if we can get that right then the 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 promise of cannabis for this country and for the world is really ceilingless it really is yeah no i agree the, the collaboration between the, the government and the the actual people that are working in the industry and the education right just pro providing that education and information so that we do remove the stigma that's been in place with the plant for so long um, and we get past that and we start to see the, the, the true benefits, you know, both on the economic side, the medicinal side, um, every, every side, really. I mean, cannabis touches a lot of different areas of life. Um, so I couldn't agree more with you. And John, um, before we, we get off, um, do you want to go ahead and let people know where they can find New Bloom Labs, um, whether it be your website or your social media channels? Yeah, so the website is uh, newbloomlabs.com, uh, at newbloomlabs for Insta, slash newbloomlabs at Facebook. Uh, also, you can call us directly, uh, toll free at 844-TEST-CBD. It's 844-TEST-CBD. You'll get um, a hold of, of one of our customer service reps or, or someone in our lab or perhaps even myself, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I do want to mention really quick, you know, last year we innovated um, – we wanted to find a way to reach hemp producers where they were. And, you know, our labs in Chattanooga or in Dallas. And so, you know, uh, someone in Memphis, you know, isn't going to drive their sample to us. So you have to rely on the postal service. So we, and we, we came up with these sampling kits. And so in them, we provide sample, uh, you know, plant collection bags, vials, um, you know, everything, order forms, collection instructions, everything you need to take an effective sample for lab testing. Um, now, what we're seeing is that we really were innovative because a lot of our competitor, our friendly competitor labs have, have started offering sampling kits as well, and that's fine. 
But uh, if you're interested in a sampling kit, you want to try out New Bloom Labs, go to our website, newbloomlabs.com, and just hit send sample kit, fill out that brief little form and send it to us. We'll get it out to you the same day. And there's no, there's no charge for that? No charge. It's free. Do you hear that right there, people? You want your free sampling testing kit? Uh, you can go to newbloomlabs.com and request it. Just simp uh, simply fill out a form and you're good to go. So, well, John, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to talking to you again in the future as, as things evolve, especially as we learn from this first year in Texas. It's an exciting time. Yeah, it really is. And I'm, I am going to be in Texas here in a couple of weeks. So we've definitely got to, you know, get, get breakfast or something and, and, and connect in person. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and uh, it's exciting times in Texas. And so um, I just urge everyone in the industry to, to, to come together and collaborate uh, so that we can make sure that this opportunity is extended to us for years and decades to come. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, John. I look forward to our, uh, our breakfast or we can even play around a round of golf when you're in town. We'll, you know, we'll figure it out, <laughs> but thank you so much everybody for listening and I'll talk to you again next time. Yeah.